HRN listeners. As we celebrate our 15th year, we are deepening our commitment to giving voice to the next generation of food system storytellers, and we need your help. Our internship and fellowship programs help activate new possibilities for underrepresented and underestimated young people through experiential journalism, audio engineering, and production training. Through these unique programs, HRN helps food equity stewards build essential workforce readiness skills that expand their potential and foster economic mobility. Please consider supporting these critical programs. And with a minimum donation, you can be entered to win a dinner for two at an amazing restaurant in one of eight cities and tickets to a concert at a great venue in one of those cities. We have incredible partners across the country who have donated as they also share our passion for helping to educate the next generation of food system storytellers. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. And make sure you donate before March 31st. Thank you. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. HRN is food radio supported by you. Learn more at heritageradionetwork.org. This episode is brought to you by Roberta's, home of Heritage Radio Network since 2009. Learn more about Roberta's at robertaspizza.com. Hey, hey, welcome to Beer Sessions Radio on Heritage Radio Network. Hey, I'm Jimmy Carboni. I'm the host here. It's our 14th year with Beer Sessions Radio. And quite often we do uh, hard cider episodes, which more and more are my favorite episodes. So we got some good hard cider buddies in the room, and we're going to talk. So let's go around the room and introduce ourselves. I'm Jimmy Carboni. I'm the host of Beer Sessions Radio. And then Ron and then Dave, and then Anthony. Hi, I'm Ron Sanson. I am the president of the Cider Institute of North America. I'm the founder of the Connecticut Cider Association and the owner and cider maker at Spoke and Spy Cider in Middletown, Connecticut. And I'm Dave Carr. I am owner, cider maker, and janitor and orchard worker at uh, Raging Cider and Mead out here in San Marcos, California, San Diego County. Uh, and I'm Anthony Lopez. I'm the Cidrero of uh, Casa de Oro Cider out of Los Angeles. And uh, yeah, like Dave, I'm a yeast babysitter. So. <laughs> so when Ron and I were talking the other day, we were wanted to talk about East Coast versus the West Coast cider scene. But I think we're going to go a lot deeper than that. Um, Dave, why don't we start with kind of your day-to-day, what's going on in June at Rage Insider? You know, uh, the tasks you're doing and uh, the climate and culture and everything. Well, climate, let's start there. It's really weird this year because normally we're getting kind of warm and it's uh, been much cooler and pretty much cloudy continuously for almost two months now. Um, but uh, what we're doing right now in June is – is uh, we're trying to get through the rest of our batches from last year. So we're either bottling, like we just bottled last night, some cider that we've been aging and we reserve some of the juice, put it back into the batch, and then we bottled it so it'll do a natural carbonation. Um, we're also in the process of disgorging other batches from the year previous. Um, so those are pretty much keeping us busy all the time. So That's great. And Ron, for you, out east? I mean, it's uh, the the climate's been a little weird. We had some 90 degree days and then we had some frost. So I think that affected some of the trees, but I'm not a grower, so it didn't affect me directly yet. Um, but when I go to buy juice, it will. Um, otherwise, it's just, you know, making kegs and getting them out. That's what we do every day. Kegs, kegs, kegs. <laughs> and then, but, but, both of you have interesting backgrounds, you know, what does or did your day job, how did it influence your brand and, and what you're doing? 
Uh, on my part, my day job is I, I'm a sheet metal worker. Um, so it didn't really influence my brand other than my tasting room has a lot of cool sheet metal in it because <laughs> I have to make it all. <laughs> but, uh, and I've made some of my tanks as well. So, um, but yeah, I, the farming thing is almost like a separate, it's kind of my Zen place um, outside of uh, doing my sheet metal job. Yeah. What about you, Ron? Uh, my background is in graphic design. So I went to art school in London and I drank a lot of cider in London and just came back and tried to find cider and couldn't. So I started making it. Um, while I was doing that, I was you know, doing the design thing. So I worked for uh, marketing and advertising and things like that for companies like Diageo and Pepsi and some other beverage brands. So kind of took the beverage route. And, uh, loving every minute of it. Are you yeah. doing your own labels, Ron? Yeah, I do all my own work. Um, I have no packaged goods, so I don't really do labels, but like T-shirts, logo design, stuff like that, merch. It's all me. Good stuff. You know, when, when I was first thinking about Rage and Cider, I had no idea where you were. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we, we know that it, it's in uh, Dan Pucci's book. But tell us about your region, San Marcos, we're, hills so we're, around San Diego. We're in San Diego County, so we're literally we have we're growing apples in our local mountains. So San Diego County is a really interesting terroir here because we basically we're from the beach, and then you get up into some flatlands, and then you go up into uh, foothills, which are closer to two thousand feet, and then our mountains range anywhere from thirty five hundred to six over six thousand feet tall. So. Most of the orchards we have here are in the between 3,500 and 5,500 feet in elevation. Um, so one of our orchards is literally, as the crow flies, about 20 miles north of the Mexican border. Um, that's actually our, the largest one that we take care of. It has about 900 trees, um, either full standards or semi standards. Um, and then we have one orchard that's in the foothills, it's about 1,800. Feet. And it's kind of at the edge of where you can grow apples. In fact, a lot of what we do there is experiment with varieties to see what will grow at a lower chill. Wow. You know, the only real West Coast cider makers I know are, are Tilted Shed. And um, what, what kind of apples are you using? Trees? Are you using things like quince? Yeah, we, we actually, we grow... we. <laughs> So actually where I live in the foothills is uh, I found an entire feral orchard growing on a hillside of, of uh, pineapple quince. So we harvest those. Um, the owners were like, yeah, we don't know what those things are. You can have them. So, <laughs> so we go every year and just harvest off them. They don't get watered or anything. They're just, they're just there existing. Um, we use a lot of pears. The funny thing about San Diego is on the East Coast, you guys have a, a ton of wild apples, but for whatever reason, pears like to reproduce here in our local mountains. So we have tons of wild pears. So uh, we've been foraging for a lot of these wild pears and, and then propagating the ones that we really like. So, um, and then apple varieties, uh, we have, I mean, we have uh, the ones that have been here for forever, any, anything from Jonathan to uh, Arkansas Black, Black Twig, um, both the Stamen Wine Sap and Wine Sap. Uh, Northern Spy grows well here. Um, and then there's a lot of newer orchards that have been planted with everything from all, you know, Yarlington Mill to Kalaus to Kingston Black. Kingston Black is really finicky here, though. Um, and uh, Nihau is an is a interesting apple because it absolutely loves it here. It, it produces gangbusters here. So, so we have, you know, a lot of traditional, like, old world cider apples. i am also been trading... Um, Scion would back and forth with people on the East Coast like John at Black Duck or, or the guys at Floral Terrains or Rose Hill. Um, and and so I'm trialing a bunch of their wild varieties that they have um, out here. And I've sent them wild varieties from here. So oh, that's cool. Yeah. Hey, Ron, uh, you always have good questions and you wear many hats in the cider world. What, what, what's a good question for Dave? Um, maybe something about his fermentation, because I know he does a lot of really interesting ferments, like the uh, 
carbonic maceration and lots of weird stuff. Yeah, well, we do all native ferments. Um, so with, with our ciders and we make some mead too, um, but with our, and some of our meads are done natively, but um, all of our ciders and perries and quince and plum jerkums are all natively fermented. Uh, we use carbonic maceration when we do plums just because it, it makes a better product. I found um, you get more fruitiness out of it and, and it dampens down the acidity just a pinch and also likes to drop out a lot of the solids when we actually press it off. Um, we also do carbonic maceration when we make wine, so which we made a lot of last year because we had a very tiny apple crop because last year was our, our freezing event. So, um, yeah. So we do a lot of barrel fermentation and uh, aging on the lees and use botanage. So we're stirring the lees continuously while it's aging in the barrel. So a lot of different techniques. Well, Dave, you really come on the scene. I was talking with Steve Salen of South Hill earlier today and, and mentioned you. Um, what resources are you taking advantage of as, as you're learning? Because you're definitely talking to people all over the country. Oh, yeah. I, I, well, that's it. I mean, I, <laughs> I've taken advantage of the um, opportunity to talk to people and, and pick people's brains and and then when people, the thing that's been cool is when other people have been asking questions, I've been able to help them as well. So it's, I kind of feel it's a, it's a great thing to be able to pay forward um, all the help that I've gotten from anyone like Steve or, or um, Scott and Ellen at Tilted Shed gave me a lot of help. John at Black Duck gave me a lot of input. Um, also Ryan at Fieldbird Cider, that's where up in Canada, Talking to him is where I learned about botanage and, and the whole concept of um, fermenting in barrel. Um, so our first year, a bunch of our stuff came out super funky, like some in a good way and some in not so good of a way because I just filled the barrels and let it ferment and wasn't stirring the leaves or anything. And so after talking with him, it it really kind of opened my eyes to, to, to the process. Wow. And, you know, and going CiderCon has like, from time to time, some really cool um, uh, talks there when you go to that and, and taking advantage of, you know, other people's expertise, just attending those chats. That's great. Ron, uh, back to you getting started. You know, Middletown, Connecticut, Spoken Spy. Tell us about when you made the jump from cider enthusiast to a professional. I had been making cider at home for a very long time and just looking for a place to do it commercially. And when you find the perfect place, you know, it's the time and it just happened and it uh, happened pretty quickly. You know, we were open within a year. I had taken the Cena courses. So I had like the background technical training from Cider Institute of North America. I knew all the cider makers pretty much in America at that time too. So that helped. And then um, just, you know, a lot of connections and finding juice and finding equipment, and, you know. And then uh, we opened on, what was it, March 14th, Pi Day. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, and it's been, uh, you know, crazy. I think that was six years ago. So it's been uh, crazy times. And what's your week like or your biggest challenges right now? Because I know you just finished a bunch of kegs today. Yeah, before COVID, we had a tasting room and I ran, you know, just a tasting room model. And now we're just distribution model. I, I don't deal with uh, consumers face to face anymore just because it was easier for me with my schedule and, you know, being the only person in the business. I don't have any employees. So just doing the distribution, making kegs, getting out there, you know, fermenting all that on my own. And it's fun. I get to see the state of Connecticut, all of it every week mm -hmm. so <laughs> you've made some cool stuff i mean i've had some things you've made with beets and you did something with green tea yeah we did a plum beet jerkum which is dave was talking about jerkums before i i don't remember i think yeah you did have that one which is the plums it's a kind of different ferment but uh, yeah we try to keep it interesting i do a lot of one of the first ones we did was a tapache called tapash mode which um, 
is, you know, that <laughs> spicy pineapple drink. And there's a lot of history behind that. Yeah, I I actually, the first time I had it was Rev Nats, and he makes a fantastic tatashe. Um, everyone does it a little different, I think, and it's just like, you know, when you talk about, like, uh, sauces like a mole in Mexico, like, everyone has their own recipe, everyone does it different. And I think everyone doing the tapaches is uh, t- their own take on it. So, I mean, I think we're all having fun. <laughs> well, I can tell you, Dave and Anthony are, n- are not in their heads. So <laughs> I think it's a good time to get Anthony to talk. So he, you're making cider at Rage and Cider. Tell us your story, Anthony. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so uh, Dave is being my custom crush, effectively. Um, I'm out of Los Angeles where there's kind of no fighter culture at all to speak of by any stretch of the imagination. And uh, so, you know, coming up in that, I had to kind of, like most of us, figure out how to do it just by research and trial and error and um, using what was available to me, which was either store-bought juice or commercial apples, and both of which don't exactly produce, you know, stellar or super exciting, interesting uh, ciders. So um, I had to go to adjuncts and found some really interesting characteristics um, with like piloncillo and oak or like we were, I make a tapache like we were talking about or you guys are talking about, um, but I use Oaxacan honey. Um, it gives a really deep uh, flavor profile. Most of my ciders are pretty high ABV, anywhere from like eight and a half to 12. Um, I also make a, a one that's kind of based off of Jamaica with hibiscus, um, uh, Mexican vanilla, and um, agave nectar, dark agave nectar. So, um, again, trying to get tannins and acidity from the adjuncts and to create a more significantly more interesting flavor profile so that it's much more enjoyable uh, and most of my ciders are still um or very very lightly lightly carbonated which ron is not <laughs> ron says it's a very hard sell uh so yeah he's he's not a proponent of still ciders so we can say you're in the old guard then because <laughs> i remember when guys like steve wood at farnham hill were only doing still cider and he changed fast <laughs> but, uh, so you, I, you think of yourself as a fermenter, you know, where are you getting your ingredients? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm definitely, definitely a fermenter. Um, I, you know, my apples are coming from Washington, um, you know, and I get them from a you know, distribution in LA because that's just what I have available. Um, and there, you know, there's a couple places out here, Five Mile and um, Cayuma, but you know, they they're expensive. Just bottom line is they're expensive, and <clears throat> you know, with me practicing what I can do to make a you know golden delicious taste more interesting than it does. Um, I'm not saying that I'm disinterested in, you know, more traditional cider apples, um, but just where I'm currently at, it's not something I'm going, I'm going to entertain until I get to a, a better place. Wow. It's great to meet you. Ron, where did you meet Anthony? So we crossed paths at CiderCon. We were on a uh, bus tour of Frank Lloyd Wright buildings, which is pretty interesting. Yeah. So uh, the American Cider Association puts on some bus tours that are 
not directly cider tours. And uh, I guess we're both fans of architecture and we started talking and Anthony actually had received the, uh, some scholarships like for Sina. So we talked more about uh, cider education. We were visiting these cool buildings all around Chicago. Well, Dave, t- tell us about how you got to know Anthony and h- how is he fitting in with your facility? I think, well, originally I just s- saw something popped up somewhere and it was like a cideries in LA and his companies popped up. So I started following them and then I, Actually, ran across him at CiderCon as well. So, <laughs> so we talked a lot more at CiderCon. That's cool. Hey, we're gonna go back to uh, geeking out. So the other day, Dave, I asked you what you were doing, and you said you have to repair a tractor, which is pushing back our mowing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm still working on that. I have. It sat since last year because I had some other issues, which I fixed. And when I turned it on, it's now got all kinds of hydraulic issues. So I'm in the middle of fixing that stuff so we can get out. And we like to mow while the grass is still green up in the orchards because I don't want to start a fire. (laughs) So um, anyways, that's, you know, that's what I've been doing besides doing the cidery stuff. You know, one thing whether it's frost or wildflowers, fires, it, it seems that the orchard base cider makers are really in touch with climate change mm-hmm. in ways that most of us as consumers are. Um, let's, let's go down that path. And you mentioned, you know, mowing when it's green. Uh, how else are you responding to the climate and everything around you well i'm a huge believer in regenerative agriculture because i mean one of the biggest polluters or putting um promoters of putting carbon into the atmosphere is traditional farming so when you're plowing you're releasing carbon from that's been sequestered in the soil back into the atmosphere so we practice no-till farming um in everything we do uh both at our home orchard um and then the Guatai Orchard, same thing. We basically just mow everything in. We we draw, we're lucky at the Guatai Orchard. There's actually a mushroom farm there, so we take all the leftover debris from uh, their mushroom making or growing, and we we use that to um, put around the trees to rot in place. Um, at our place, we and there and our place, we do uh, like winter cover crops that are high in nitrogens and also drill down into the soil and, and uh, open the soil up um, for oxidation and water penetration. Um, so those are all, you know, things that the little things that we feel that we can do um, to, to, uh, to prevent any further climate change. Also, we source only here within San Diego County. So part of that is to keep our footprint, our carbon footprint extremely small. So. Yeah. And Rod, for you, out, out east, I mean, there's the Connecticut River Valley. There's old forests with old trees. Uh, what, what's your take on climate, or, or proper ways to work? I mean, here at the cidery, I just buy juice from people. So I don't directly work with climate things, but it does affect me because the price of juice goes from three dollars a gallon to sometimes ten dollars a gallon for the exact same juice just you know months apart which is pretty crazy but um out here you know the orchards i deal with have been hit by that frost we had in may um and i guess a lot some of them have no apples so they're talking about just growing pumpkins this year so it's a a kind of sad and I won't be able to get these fantastic apples this year. But, uh, do, do a lot a lot of the apple growers have backups, like juice or sources from out of the region? No. No. So I buy juice mostly from, it used to be I, I would drive to the orchards, but now with the climate, it's like I kind of have to deal with trucking. And, you know, maybe the furthest I go is four hours or five hours from our cidery. For juice, so I try to keep it as local as possible. Well, what about you, Anthony? 
you know, you're in LA. I don't really think too much about Southern California and, and cider. That's, that's fair because Southern California <laughs> doesn't really have any cider. I mean, really, really does, except for Dave, right? <laughs> they don't have any really good cider with the exception of a few. Um, and, but I, um, crush and macerate. I mean, I go from fruit, but, and do all that. Um, I haven't noticed the effects, um, of climate change as much again, cause I'm using, you know, commercially grown apples, you know, uh, culinary apples and it's, they're, they are a plenty. So, um, unlike Dave, you know, almost kind of the near opposite of Dave. I, while I deal with the fruit uh, themselves, I'm not working in orchard and seeing just how much of an impact the climate is having, you know, at the root, at the root of everything. Um, I'm just, I'm just getting the fruit. So. Yeah. Well, last year, I know California had some droughts and I'm speaking in general terms, but how, how important is water and rainfall for apples and the fruit that you guys are using? So, so the interesting thing is, yeah, we, we grow in a, uh, a drought region that we're actually planting either. We've actually gotten to now planting only standard, full standard trees um, in the past we, we were doing uh, semi-standards and I'm still messing around with a new um, rootstock B118 and for a semi-standard to see how, how it works. But um, I'm becoming more and more of a believer in full standards because I look at these orchard, like we, that we managed an orchard up in Julian that's from the early 1900s and it's all dry farmed. There's no irrigation on the property and it produces apples and pears every year. So to more or less extent, depending on how the winters were and how much water built up in the soil. But uh, it, it produces every year. So that's, again, making me more and more of a believer in, in in the full standard tree for at least Southern California. Unless you have – there's some of the orchards have – there's fault lines and they have plenty of water coming up through the fault lines. But – where we're growing, there's one or the Guatari orchard has water, but the rest are pretty much water free. So, yeah. Hey, uh, switching subjects to your tap room mix. I've noticed that whether they're breweries or, or, or other makers, there's a lot of conversation about how to draw in more customers and give them a wider selection of products, even things that people don't make. And a lot of times it's hard seltzer. Um, I noticed that you're raging cider and mead. So yeah. why mead? Uh, well, that speaks to the American palate, which tends to the sweet. So um, we start, when I first started, I was going to make mead, but I was going to do dry meads because I, I want to take advantage of all of the bounty of this county, which is, includes honey and tons and tons of uh, local farms. Um, so we wanted to use uh, local fruit, but I found that people kept asking for something sweet. So uh, the, the meat thing actually probably kept us in business because it, it, it's about a third of our sales. And and uh, and it when I get a group that comes in, there's always going to be one or two people that like something sweet. And so it's something that appeals to them. I mean, we, we occasionally get a cider that doesn't ferment dry. And so I'll have one cider on tap that's semi-sweet, but or off dry, but, but, uh, like I said, the, the mead thing really appeals to the people that, that like sweet. And I actually developed kind of our own following in the mead world of people who like the particular style of mead that we make. So, so what is your style? Like what's the ABV? It's, it's, I kind of, so our ciders are all, our ciders tend to be in the eight to 12% range just because of our growing um, conditions here. Um, so I've kept my meads in that same range. Most of them are in the 9% range. Um, I I started making mead a certain way because I don't particularly like mead. <laughs> so I, I made mead in a way that I can enjoy, which was to ferment the honey down to a desired sweetness. And then we'll, at that point, we stabilize it and, and then we'll add the fruit in and let it age on the fruit. 
and then and then transfer it off and, and put it to keg. So. Wow. Ron, I know you got some fermentation questions. I want you guys to geek out. <laughs> you can talk about a certain beverage, s- s- something that our listeners wouldn't know about. Hmm. <laughs> you mentioned some things, really... jerkum. Uh, yeah, jerkum's but, a little weird. I think, you know, different fruits. Botanage. Batanage. Batanage. Yeah, batanage is the stirring of, uh, so, especially when you're fermenting in a barrel, you all the leaves, which is the dead yeast and whatever, sink to the bottom of the barrel and you lay there. Um, so batanage it, it basically looks like a little golf club or whatever you stick in the barrel and you stir the leaves up um, every time you go to the top of your barrels and that and the leaves goes back in a suspension what it does is it, i don't know all the all the um chemistry of it but it's a, it does like an autolysis and it creates like a softer mouthfeel in the cider or wine it's actually a a, a, a french wine making technique so that's and what about jerkum some jerkum is from uh, Worcester area in uh, in England originally, so which they grew more plums there than apples. Um, and traditionally, they used to blend. Uh, we do too to kill the acidity, down d- dampen down the acidity. As they, but there, I think they blend it with apples to, to kind of raise their ABV. Where here, we're doing it to 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 drop the acidity down a little bit. So we'll usually do about 20, 25 percent apple, and and then the balance will be all plums. But like I said, when we do it, we do a, a carbonic maceration, which means we put it in a tank and we fill the tank with CO2, either with li- with uh, dry ice thrown in there or we pump CO2 into the tank. And then it's an oxygen-free environment and the plums start to ferment from the inside. It's a different process. And uh, what you get with that, you get kind of more fruity notes out of it. Um, so, and then once... Once the plums are starting to pop, basically they swell. You ever seen a plum that's um, just in nature laying on the ground and it's started swelling and it pops and all the juice is pouring out of it? That's basically carbonic, um, what happens in a carbonic maceration. So at that point, we'll transfer them out and uh, press them off and then let the fer- fermentation continue um, as a standard fermentation. I think that was a, a modern plums. technique for things like Beaujolais Nouveau, right? Yeah, Beaujolais Nouveau is kind of a carbonic maceration. Um, and, you know, I don't know how in the past they got the CO2 in their other, I, to be honest with you, I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's how they do that too. And we do, we do like a Sanso wine and we use carbonic maceration on that as well. Cool. Ron Smiling. Uh, what varieties of, of uh, plums? Do we have? Um, well, we have. Uh, well, it's it's the wild like native plum to the southeast U.S. I, Prunus augustifolia. Um, I think they're called sand plums or or um, Choctaw plums or something like that as well. And then we have. There's actually a number of wild plums that have spawned on this property at Danik Watai that we use. And then there's plums that we have no idea what they are. And then we've also used, uh, there's like a elephant ear plum. We had a, we, the last plum jerkin we made, we got a number of plums from a grower just on the north side of Palomar Mountain from us. Um, and I don't honestly remember all the varieties, but, but they were lower acidity plums. So I was happy to use them. A lot of plums. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So when we have them, it's a lot of plums. We didn't get plums last year because they all froze, and they all froze this year. So I had a damson single varietal jerkum. It was pretty interesting too. And that's what I think in England they traditionally use is mostly damsons. Yeah, I think they're a little bit lower acidity as well. So, so do you think there are proper jerkum plums? That's a proper jerkum plum. So if we're using like this American culinary plum, is it a jerkum? I don't know. It's still a jerkum, but kind of like with the perries. Like use the culinary pears. Is it a perry? Well, yeah, that's a, that's the question, isn't it? So um, yeah. 
I, I would still consider it a parry, but I don't know that it's necessarily a good parry. Um, you know, not Without that I proper parry pairs. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think you know, parry. You need the acidity or or and or um, tannins that you get from from uh, proper pairs or wild pairs that you you won't get from a culinary pair. Plus, the other thing I found with culinary pairs is they tend to have higher levels of sorbitol. So, yes. What does the sorbitol do? <laughs> yeah, it'll keep you very regular if you get too much of it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great thing to take before you're going to go get a. Uh, get scoped <laughs> so, is that the that's the prune effect yeah exactly yeah it's uh, an unfermentable sugar and what happens is it is fermentable by the bacteria in your lower gut so uh, well hey listen we're off to a great start we're going to take a short break we'll be back in a few minutes on beer sessions radio this episode is brought to you by roberta's home of heritage radio network Roberta's was founded in Bushwick in 2008 and has become one of the most iconic restaurants in the country. HRN made its home inside of Roberta's in 2009, and together they have become part of the DIY fabric of the neighborhood. Roberta's is open for lunch and dinner seven days a week and serves much more than just the famous wood-fired pizzas. Their team dreams up new salads, pastas, and sandwiches on the regular. Roberta's Tiki Bar is alive and well in the back garden, serving up frozen drinks in the summer and hot toddies in the winter. Stop by the bakery and takeout spot next door for fresh breads, sticky buns, and pizzas to go. But Roberta's also extends beyond Bushwick, with multiple locations in New York City, Long Island, and Los Angeles. You can also find their frozen pies in grocery stores around the country. The spirit of Roberta's, like Heritage Radio Network, is everywhere. Here's to many more years of pizza-powered radio. Learn more about Roberta's at robertaspizza.com. Hey, hey, welcome back to Beer Sessions Radio on Heritage Radio Network. It's our 14th year. Support us at heritageradionetwork.org. So we're talking East Coast and West Coast cider and and mead and jerk them with Rage and Cider and Spoken Spy. And Anthony, what's... What's your brand called? Casa de Oro Cider. In L.A. So uh, let's go deeper. Ferment Geek Out. You were talking about plums for jerk um, What's another oddball drink that you're making? Do you make a June or other types of mead? No, I don't do a June. I do. I, I mean, I do a lot of things like sizers, which is, you know, like apple. We take apple juice that we press and we'll put honey into it and just let it go on the wild yeast. Um, we make pine mints. So that's also uh, same same idea with grapes. We'll um, press the grapes off and or we'll foot stomp the grapes down and dump honey into them and then let it ferment as a full cluster, then press the whole thing off. Or if it's a white wine grape, we'll just press the grapes off and then add the honey and let it just go um, all on the native yeast. Other things. So, and we do a lot of co, uh, like um, co-fermentations with apple and grape. Because there's a lot of, there's a huge grape where they call San Diego County um, America's oldest, newest wine region. So, <laughs> <laughs> You know, the Spaniards came up, they started the missions here, and this is where they first started planting the, uh, the mission grapes and then went on up the coast. So, but it's the wine, it never took off here as a big wine region until just recently. It's it's really kind of blowing up uh, in conjunction with the, um, what's the valley in Mexico, just south of the border? I'm blanking on it right now. Uh, yep, me too. Oh, anyways. Yeah. So just south of here, there's a valley that has become a really starting to be is a huge up and coming wine region as well. Kind of cool thing about that is there's a winery down there that I've been talking to and uh, there it's got mountains around it as well. And there's apple trees and quince trees and pear trees. So at some point, I'm going to go down and work with them and do kind of a collaborative uh, uh, effort down in uh, Baja of a kind of a cider wine co-ferment. What's it like fermenting with quince? Quince, well, it's the same as cider. It's just generally when we grind quince up, uh, it's like when we do the um, wild pears, we'll we'll grind it up and we'll let it macerate for 24 hours before we press it off. Um, 
just to kill any, you know, to drop any tannins down. Um, and then it's funny because I always perceive quince as acidic, but it's not really as acidic as, as it as it comes across. So you have to be careful and balance your acidity and make sure. Um, sometimes we'll use apple to, to balance it. And sometimes it's just within an acceptable range for fermentation. Well, I was looking at the Instagram and one post you were drinking the quince. I don't know if it was wine or cider from Tilted Shed. Oh, yeah. There's a yeah quince wine. It's a 100% pineapple quince wine. It's quite good. Keep going, then. Tell me more about Tilton Shed. Well, their ciders are phenomenal. I, I love their stuff. Um, but, the, yeah, Quince is interesting, too, because it's got these floral, tropical notes to them. So it's, but it's related to pears and apples. But, yeah, Tilton Shed are great people. Um, I'm actually only in one cider club, and it's theirs. <laughs> <laughs> and, Rod, for you, you know, you've, you know, the whole scene and, cider in america tell us a couple of highlights from from the west coast people that you like ciders you like um well raging you won't of get course. in trouble <laughs> raging of course um i love the uh cider summit events out there because you could try so many different ciders i don't know have you participated in those dave yeah we did the last one they did in san francisco i think they're doing I haven't, I don't know yet. There, there might be a smaller version of it coming up this year, but I haven't heard much on that since, since a preliminary discussion. So, oh, another one I like is art and science. Have you had any of that? Oh, I love their stuff. <laughs> it's so interesting and so wild and funky and beautiful bottles. And I think yeah, uh, she all her artwork. <laughs> yeah, Kim, she does great. Like it's like paper cut labels. It's amazing. They've come to New York a couple of times, not recently. And there's, um, oh, wow, I, I'm like drawing a blank. Steve Z. Um, Steve, uh, you had him at Jimmy's. Uh, Easy Orchards? Easy Orchard, yeah. And that's that was fantastic stuff. His Perry was great. Yeah, they're defunct now. That was... He is? I didn't know that. Yeah, oh, they, they're it. not making cider anymore. I think they're still selling apples and stuff. but Farm store. Great, great orchard. Yeah. And Anthony, any favors for you or European ciders? Um, East Coast? There's a small one in on the Central Coast out here uh, called Bristol's that I like. A lot of people, for whatever reason, haven't heard of them. Not, they're not real big into the scene, but they make some really good, clean um, stuff. So the only one I like from them a lot is their funkiest one. Well. Yeah, the, the, uh, <laughs> the Skimmington. Yeah, the Skimmington. Yeah, I love that one. It's but everybody else is like, uh, you go there and you ask them about it, and they're like, yeah. Well, know. they actually get really. So when I asked them for a bottle, they got really excited and poured me a free bottle because <laughs> they're so excited. It's almost asking for it. Yeah. yeah, it's definitely. You go there and you ask for. They kind of. They definitely do look at you a little different and go, oh, so you know something about it. Huh? It's, it's good. Yeah. It's, yeah. Hey, Ron, uh, you mentioned that Anthony was taking some Cena classes. Tell us about Cena and uh, what classes are available that someone like Anthony has learned from. Uh, so Cena is the, I believe, the world's largest nonprofit cider education program. We offer classes online and in person, so you could go and learn hands-on how to make cider. It's a great background for, for me, it was like about learning how to solve problems and how, how everything works. But um, the online classes, of course, became popular over the last few years. But uh, there's something about being there and, you know, seeing and smelling and touching and tasting things. Um, Anthony, I think you did the one of the, the entry class. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just finished that up about, I don't know month and a half ago maybe something like that um and yeah i mean it was it's it's a more empirical approach to the process um with you know formulas and stuff that if you into that kind of thing you can apply them when necessary um i'm a pretty 
I like that technical aspect of things, but I'm not a very um, technically minded person. So um, I have to work pretty hard to, you know, get all my numbers right. Um, I come from a um, art background. So, um, but the course was great. Um, I was able to ask all the questions. I mean, I've been making cider for the last almost six years. So this course was more, there were small things that I could ask, get into the weeds about with, you know, some of the instructors there and they could answer all kinds of questions that I just couldn't find on my own or couldn't really ask anybody else. But they have a bunch of, you know, cider nerds working there or maybe cider scholars is a better way to put it. So um, you can ask them loads of questions and I could not stump them. So uh, it, was, it was great for that for that aspect for me. Anthony, for radio, just give us one example. Um, well, we were talking about um, like carbonation levels and trying to calculate, uh, you know, CO2, PSI in a bottle and how much sugar to add, but how much residual sugar, how much residual CO2 could have been still in suspension. And then trying to figure out, you know, if I'm going to bottle condition something, how much uh, sugar to add um, based on the value of CO2 and suspension. But there, that isn't really something that's just simple to figure out because temperature plays a factor into CO2. So you have to figure out, you know, what your temperature is and then an estimated CO2 and then your sugar source you have to be real careful with because, you know, if you're just using pure like white sugar, it's a little bit more calcul uh, calculable. But if you're using, you know, brown sugar or something else like that to prime, it's going to throw all your numbers out of whack. So um, CO2, CO2 and carbonation, forced carbonation or, or bottle conditioning is like a whole thing that you really have to take the time to learn and dedicate yourself to that sort of science and, and math aspect of it um, if you want to get it really good, um, in my opinion. Um, but like I said, I was able to ask, um, uh, uh, Stephen Tressler, like just kind of get into the weeds with it. And he was just all about, he had all the answers, um, that I went, you know, that's a little more involved than I, my brain can handle. So I'm going to thank you for the answer, but I'm going to, you know, I'm going to take that information and, and use it. And that's why you're making still cider. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit, yeah. A little bit. I get that. All right, back to some field work with Dave. Dave, what is top work graphs, and what are you doing with them? Uh, so what we're doing is that we took over an orchard at Quatai, and they had uh, – other than trees scattered around the property, I had one um, small orchard on it already that was full of Granny Smith and Red Delicious apples for the most part. There were a couple of wine saps, uh, Jonathan and uh, Golden Delicious, I think, as well. But uh, we concentrated on the Red Delicious and Granny Smith, and we basically will cut off most of the branches and we'll leave one mother branch on the tree, and then we'll graft onto those branches. Um, the leftover parts of the branches, the new apple varieties we want to grow. Um, so whether it was Kingston Black or Nihau or Kalaus or Field Barrel or whatever it was that we were putting on there. Um, so the first year, those grass will grow out, the branches will grow out, and then the next year we go back and we cut the mother branch off. So once those grass can, uh, those previous year's grass can support the tree, and then we'll graft onto the mother branch and basically convert the tree from a red delicious to, say, a Nihau apple tree. So it's, and it's kind of a cool way of turning dessert apples into cider varieties. Ron, uh, we're going to close out soon. So 
how about each of you ask a question of the others? What, what do you want to ask, Ron? All right. I know so you Dave, have like 20 questions. Yeah, we could talk forever. Dave, how many um, varieties of apples do you grow and how many trees? Well, we, between the trees that we own, we own about 90 trees. Um, we have a small property. Um, and then we manage two other orchards, which total probably close to 1,100 trees. Um, and we grow, we have apples, pears, and quince, like I said. Um, we have four different varieties of quince. We're probably up to about 20, 20 varieties of pears between... European varieties, some um, dessert type. We have a Lincoln pear in one of the orchards, which actually is very good for making uh, perry. In fact, from what I've heard, in the early 1900s, they made perry from these Lincoln pears up in Julian. And then, uh, like I said, we've been taking these wild pears, which there's a number in the orchard we take care of in Julian, and we've been grafting them over and, and planting them out at the Patai orchard. Um, so... There's that. And then apples, I think we probably have about 90 different varieties. So somewhere between 90 and 100. I haven't done an official count because I'm, I'm, a, I'm a collector. And <laughs> so I just keep yeah. collecting new varieties and grafting them out. So That's a lot of, a lot of different pairs. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so very cool. Growing pears is, I mean, apples, you know, after like, four years I can start harvesting apples, but on these like bigger trees, but pears are really, I think I might get my first harvest off of, um, I think a butt pear that we planted five or six years ago. So. Well, Ron, if you mind, I'll ask Anthony, do you have a question? Um, well, yeah, when am I when am I going to be able to get Spoken Spy out here on the West Coast, Ron? <laughs> Probably never. <laughs> yeah. I like to keep it small. You got to do a, a down low trade. There you go. Exactly. There's groups for that. Yep. <laughs> and then Dave, you got a question? Um, no, I just I kept blanking right now. Other than I just want to wish Ron. Uh, Good luck with that smoke. Yeah, <laughs> it's pretty, California. It's, <laughs> it's just like we're we're out in California. Yeah, Here, I have a question for Anthony. Do you have any um, unique spices or, or processes when you make your tapache that you feel make yours uh, different than other people's? Um, probably the honey. Yeah, probably the honey. I mean, I use the I use honey from Oaxaca. Um, which comes uh, very specifically off of uh, Pacific facing, Pacific Ocean facing high altitude mountains, which also kind of have a um, jungle sort of uh, terrain. So the, the honey itself has a real unique flavor profile. I personally kind of feel like if you were to put it on honey or put it on a thing of bread or something to have, it wouldn't exactly be great. But um, when all that sugar is taken out and mixed in with the, so I, my um, tapache is, uh, I use pineapple. Um, there's actually no apple in it. And um, what some people call Mexican cinnamon, but it's not. Mexican technically it's just the uh, more prevalent cinnamon you get in Mexico which is a real soft um, cinnamon soft bark rather than like a hard bark um, and it has a different flavor uh, profile to it um, mixed together it's all um, it's all pretty good this is a good one we could definitely keep talking um, let's wrap it up each of you, once again, just reintroduce yourself, your name, and where you're from. We'll do Ron, Dave, and Anthony. All right. I'm Ron Sansone from Spoke and Spy Cider Works in Middletown, Connecticut. I'm also the president of the Cider Institute of North America and the founder of the Connecticut Cider Association. 
And I'm uh, Dave Carr from Raging Cider and Mead. I'm a co-owner and a cider maker and orchardist and general laborer for uh, Raging Cider and Mead here in San Diego County um, in San Marcos. Uh, and I'm Anthony Lopez, uh, Cidrero, or cider maker, um, for those of you who don't speak Spanish, uh, of Casa de Oro Cider, uh, based out of Los Angeles. And yeah, definitely East uh, Daycare Center purveyor. <laughs> East Daycare Center. This was really great. Th- thanks so much for, for making my week. It's the smoky wildfire week in New York City. And uh, thanks so much. I'm definitely going to sign up for the Tilted Shed Cider Club. That's one of the things Dave told us. <laughs> but big thanks to our engineer, Armin Spengen. I'm Jimmy Carboni. We'll catch you next time on Beer Sessions Radio. All right. Thank you so much. Beer Sessions Radio is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network. Food radio supported by you. Keep in touch at heritageradionetwork.org slash subscribe.